Hi teammates, my name is Sean J. McCall and welcome to the Eurostep. Very glad to have you here tonight. Very glad to have my guest tonight after almost a two week pause, which is the longest one I've had. But as usual, this show aims to educate and entertain those of you that are interested in European basketball. Take a look behind the scenes at also our guests and make, make them a little bit more human and not just as athletes. Um, before we begin, for those of you that are watching live, don't forget to click down at the bottom of your screen where there's the comment section or the question mark and you can ask a question while the live is going on and I'll try to get them in while we're talking to my guests. Um, my guest for tonight's episode is someone who's also more than just an athlete. Um, he's a husband, a podcaster, and I'm hoping um, he'll become a household name in the basketball world with something that he's now developing um, outside of basketball. Um, it's a part of basketball, but we'll talk about that later. Um, Mike Carlson just finished actually yesterday his season here in in Holland, and they won the championship. That's big time. So I'm really glad to have him on. I'm ha ha happy to have a, a champion on my little podcast, and um, he played for Heroes Den Bosch. Um, so let me get him in here so we can start talking and see if he's still hungry today. Let's get him in there. Should be coming on about now. There we go. There My is. God, Mike. Hey, how we doing, Sean? Before we begin, man, I, I see the I see the uh, the the net in uh, up there uh, in your hair. I see the 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 metal in the background. Tell me, are you still drunk? <laughs> no, man. I don't I don't drink that much to begin with. But uh, <laughs> you know, a couple. Couple victory beers were indeed shared uh, last <laughs> night, and it's just it, it's part of the experience. It was great. Oh my gosh! Like yesterday, it was it was awesome. It was incredible. I, I saw the clip of you guys coming back on the bus with the trophy out and and, and the, the people around and stuff. That's pretty. That's pretty cool. I mean, I've, I've also won a couple of championships, but there's nothing. Is, is this this is not your first one though, right? Number two. This is number, number two, two for me. So, yeah. so coming back on the bus, how was the how was the feeling after after winning and coming back on the bus and seeing the fans there? Man, you know, it, it was it's really a unique experience because having won the first time I won one, it was I was so emotional because I, I had never won I had never won anything basketball related before. Wow. So it was just I was just kind of like I was a mess. <laughs> and I was just trying to like figure out what to do and where to go. And, and, and so it was, it was a bit of a disaster for the celebration, but this one, man, like, like the bus trip back was just the locker room afterwards, the bus trip back. We just had a blast, you know, we we're drinking a little bit, celebrating music was going, these clowns got on top of the bus uh, <laughs> at the end of it. And it was just like, yeah, I mean, it was, I didn't get up there. I wasn't, I was worried about coming back down. So I wasn't going to do any of that, but oh man, it was, the people were great. We have, we have a great facility here. The celebration, the pictures from it are amazing. I mean, it was, it was, it was incredible. Um, you, you said you didn't get up and up on top of the bus and celebrate, but um, how was it? How was the feeling to win it on the road? I mean, I've won also won. I've won at home, and I've also won two on the road. And for me, winning it on the road is better than winning it at home because you get to shut people up. And so, how was it to to in, in experience that that when it was game five, it was the last game, um, and it was a close one. So how 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 cool was it to win it on the road? You know, it was it it was unique, and and like I hadn't been in that. So that situation before so like you said like just to shut the other fans up but but kind of the unique thing about this is the fact that like you think about it two years ago COVID hits there are no championships last year there's no fans so this is the first time in 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 three seasons basically where the fans were there the energy was there and like right. you could just there was a tenseness in the building you know that you could just feel because not only were as players were we excited to play but the fans like they were right. there for the show they were into the game they were so passionate about it we had our section down in the corner that was all red the rest of the gym was all blue and man to keep them quiet we had we had a couple big shots late couple three-pointers that just kind of 
were daggers, really. And they mm-hmm. kind of stacked on top of each other. It just took the life out of the building. You could just feel it on our end. We had all the energy. I mean, it was, it was, it was awesome, man. You, you don't forget stuff like that, you know? And you guys had a, a special, a, a, another special thing to your story with winning this championship because it was the first time, we'll talk about it later, but it was the first time that you guys played in this, this kind of season where teams from Holland and teams from Belgium played against each other. And so yeah. not only was it you're winning your Dutch champions, yeah, um, but you're the champion over two countries. Not yet. Not yet. So that's kind of the unique thing about this. So we actually now, our season's not over. We are oh. going on, we are in the semifinals of the B next. So the combined league. Okay. So that, and that is a home and away based on total points, uh, based on aggregate. So uh, semifinal and then final, and it's going to be four games, basically five, seven, nine, eleven. So four games in, in, you know, five, six days and, and, or seven days, I guess. And then, uh, and then, yeah, so that's to see who, how that one will go, but right. uh, it's, which is kind of weird, right? Cause you just win, you're on this all time high. Right. And then it's like, Hey, we still got a little bit more season <laughs> left to go. When is the first game? Uh, June 5th, June 5th. So we got, the guys got a couple days off. So for example, Leiden, the team that we beat, uh, they play June 1st and June 3rd. Um, and then if they win, in that series, they advance on to the semifinal. Okay. So because they lost in the finals bar, it's all, it's, it's dude, they made a YouTube video structure. And it's so complicated. I won't even try to explain it. it. it, but basically, it we, st- we, we still got a little season left to play. Okay. So you guys are Dutch champions, but yes. you're not the champions of your combined leagues. Nope. Yet. Nope. Not yet. So we're the, we're the Dutch champions. And then Ustenda for the 11th time in a row is the, is the Belgian champion. Okay. And that's, so, I mean, it's one thing to, 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 to win a championship, but how was it for you? Because you didn't play, you were injured. So on the one hand, you're, you're happy for the guys. You're, you're, you're a part of the team. There's no doubt about that. But personally, you, you were in street clothes. How was, how was that add to the dynamic of winning a title? I think as a, as a competitor, as a player, you want to play, right? Yeah, like there's no, there's no question about that. That's pretty obvious to say, but, um, I, the thing that means the most to me is if you ask any of those guys in the locker room, did I have, did I have my fingerprints on this trophy? And they would all be like, yeah, like Mike was an integral part of this team. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I mean, I mean, this will tie into what we'll talk about later, but even after, even after I was down and I was out, like I was still helping with scouting. I was helping guys with tape. We were going being to involved and stuff. Yeah. Just being involved, being engaged and, uh, and it, trying to find a way to help. And I mean, even for my own mental side to kind of get over this injury, like I just couldn't give up. Not mm-hmm. really my mentality, you know, to do that, but I just didn't want to like have a big pity party for myself and right. be like, you know, I, I, and I mean, the thing is, you know, Brian Scalabrini gave this interview in 2008 after the Celtics won. Some reporter asked him, you know, how does it feel to not really play? And, you know, here's the thing, Sean, in, in five, 10 years, hey, I played, you know, nobody's going to, nobody's going to. I was starting 20 years. I was the MVP. <laughs> like, who's going to know the difference, you know? Legends grow as, as time goes on. So by the time you tell your grandkids, you, you would you would have had a triple-double in the final. <laughs> exactly. At, at least, you know? <laughs> okay. So, all right. Then let's um, wish you good, you guys, or your guys and you, your team, um, good luck in the semifinals and hopefully the finals. Um, and that, that I can post on Instagram that you are the – champions of not only Holland, but also the whole double league that you guys have going on. And we're going to talk about that in a minute as well. Um, yeah. So I just want to say, I didn't say it before. Thank you for coming on. You know, we, you, I've been on your podcast. You're, you're, you're coming back on mine now. And, and what I really like about, about the fact that I was on yours is that we really clicked and, and, got to talking and and that's really cool that's a cool thing about social media times that you meet people that you didn't normally under normal circumstances wouldn't have had the chance to meet and and we vibed and and i really appreciate the fact that that you came on to to, onto my show even though today um you probably got other things to do celebrating and being with your teammates and stuff but you still made the time to to come on and 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 do this as well um, so thank you, thank you for that. So this is how we'll go. We'll go a little bit from your humble beginnings, 
right? High school. And then we'll work our way up to current day and a little bit of the off the court stuff as well. Um, so let's start with your high school career. Um, you you had a very good high school career, where, but you were not highly recruited is what I'm assuming. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't recruited at all, to be honest. <laughs> well, I, and like, like zero letters, <laughs> zero calls. There was nothing, nothing coming my way. I, I, didn't, I didn't want to put that out there. I, I, I'm your hype man. Come on, man. Let me, let me, let me, let me hype you up a little I bit. A, I was right? a full, full zero star recruit. That's what I was. <laughs> so um, how did you end up going to college and what college did you choose and what were the, the circumstances around you going there? Yeah, so uh, to preface my uh, kind of my journey, I didn't really play AAU until after my junior year, which was late. And uh, right. the way my the way my junior season ended, because I, I was I was a guy that did everything, you know, like I was I was smart, like I was I was doing band, I was doing like I went to a private school, I was doing this, that, and the other. Mm. Um, basketball was my favorite, and then after my junior year ended, I remember that game, I just just bit me the wrong way and I was like no I'm I'm playing college basketball like this is not going to be my basketball experience mm -hmm. playing I had a I had a horrible coach playing mind games with young kids like it was just it, it was horrendous and so I said okay I'm going to play college basketball got in the weight room got after it AAU but it just wasn't enough time to really get recruited mm -hmm. uh in the college circuit. so I end up you know I was 6'6 six, six, like a, a buck 60 maybe <laughs> and and but I played point guard I could shoot I had skills, um, and I mean, if you looked at my frame, like there was no doubt I was still going to keep growing and mm. fill out and get bigger. Mm. Uh, but I just I wasn't a great athlete, um, so you know it was it was too easy, and it's still true to this day. It, teams just look at me and they just they they assume like they just pass me over based on the eye test. I don't really pass the eye test. Mm. I don't pop off. You know, I'm not dunking on people. I'm not you know crazy crossover with a crazy first step. So to get into college, I basically had to sell myself. And like, I was hitting up all these D threes and all these places. And yeah, I ended up going to Hope College, a uh, division three school in, in, mm. in Michigan. And, uh, and yeah, it was it, it, good school, uh, good program. I wanted to be a part of it. They were like, yeah, you'll come in here and play and do all this and that. And then as soon as I got there, the first day, they have tryouts, first day of tryouts, there's 45 other freshmen oh. trying out for the team. So didn't even make the varsity team, ended up being on the JV team. And then on top of that, didn't even play, was playing like four minutes a game on the JV team, which was brutal. I remember my parents came out for a game in Thanksgiving. And, uh, and I was like, I played like three minutes. I got their best player. I drew two fouls on their best player, got him out of the game, hit a three, like played well in like the very limited time that I was in. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, I don't know. I don't know if it was I, – I had another guy at my position who was also having a very good season. I don't know if it was because I, was, I wasn't a local guy. Like, that school's in Michigan. I'm from northern Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, don't, I don't really know why I didn't play that first year. But, yeah, it was, it, was, it was really hard to get my foot in the door in the college ranks, and it was even harder to get on the floor once I was there. Cause I, and, and, and you got to understand, too, like my frame, my body, it was, I just I needed more time to right. develop. Some people develop later. It's, it's normal. What were, yeah. at, that, at that point, when you were at Hope, what was your basketball goal? Could you see, did you have like an NBA dream or were you just like happy to be at a college? And what, what were your goals at that time? I mean, I, you know, I wanted to play college basketball. That mm -hmm. was like after my junior year. That was the goal. That, like, I'm going to find a way to play college basketball. And then my only goal when I was there, I wasn't thinking professionally, like, of course you dream of being in the right. NBA or doing all that, you know, but like, for me, it was just like, no, like I want to figure out how to play now and play on this team and, and become good at this game and, and be recognized for that and play at a higher level and do all this and that. But yeah, I didn't really have any direct aspirations to go be a pro or do any of that that was just I, I was so hyper focused on on the moment and and my training and development and practices and competing mm -hmm. and it was just you know maybe I should have had a, a bigger perspective but you got the college experience too you know I'm an uh, 18 year old kid right first time at college kind of yeah. doing all that stuff but like basketball was the one thing I was like I'm gonna I'm gonna figure I'm gonna figure this out and so after your freshman season at Hope then you transfer to Truman University how did the contact come to Truman, and was how 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 did you 
think, okay, I need to leave here in order to improve? Uh, so yeah, I, the, to, the leaving hope was kind of an easy decision. Cause I remember I, I met with my coach. We had like three games left in the season. And I was like, dude, like what, what gives here? Like, why am I not playing? Just pretty direct. You know, I was, yeah. I was an arrogant kid. And, uh, uh, but I had, I, you know, there was something going on that was weird and he couldn't give me a straight answer. Like he just couldn't. And I was just like, I'm wasting my time here. And, and, uh, Truman came along because, uh, the coach there at the time was the grad assistant when my uncle played there in like 1980. And mm -hmm. so we had that connect. My, my dad is also in the college basketball coaching world. So they had crossed paths a couple times right. before and, uh, luckily, luckily they were going to have seven seniors that year. And so he hadn't really heavily recruited for the incoming class. He was more worried about the year after us. And those were the kind of kids he, or that, that those were the years that he was recruiting. And so there was a walk on spot available. And the, the true story behind it is I, we went down there for a visit and the visit went well you know I'm I, at this time I'm almost six seven and a half almost six eight and uh you know still pretty lean um but he saw a video on Facebook of me juggling in a high school talent show <laughs> and yeah and uh and that was that was kind of like well he's got he's got some hands like he's got some good coordination like I, high I hand coordination do with it. yeah so uh, you know <laughs> that is that is the actual true story of how I ended up at <laughs> at Truman State so so you can put that in your bio good juggler yep. got me through college <laughs> hey hey man hey, here's the thing Formula One guys do it to to warm up for right. theirs it's it's a good skill to have yeah. No doubt. So when I checked out your stats and stuff at Truman, what what really stood out to me was that every year you got consistently better. You had a pretty solid sophomore year, but like your junior and senior year, you like really put on some 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 good stats and, and stuff like that. What attributed what attributed to that? Was it that your body started filling out? You 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 were probably already a smart player, but you grew into yourself. What was the the fact that you really started laying it up after after your freshman year. Well, I think I think there were, there was probably three different factors to this. So the the, the main one would be my body. Um, it, I had enough time and enough training under my belt to to be strong enough to hold myself and make moves and finish through contact and and the athleticism to move well and you know I grew a little bit more and all that stuff. Um, the second thing was I, I earned a scholarship and uh, instead of having to work in the summer and uh, my parents um, gave me some money, they said, Hey, if you, you got a scholarship, you got a shot with this basketball thing. We'll, we'll support you. Uh, we'll give you some, some finances throughout the year. And I mean, that was, that really opened the door for me to go from having to work basically full time in the summer and, and be able to work on out top of that. And then now I can, I can, fully concentrate on training. Um, yeah. So that was, that was an incredible step for me. And then the third thing would just be, uh, you know, the, the coach there, he, we had a new coach come in. So the guy who I, I got there who watched the juggling video, he, he went out, <laughs> new guy came in first look, same idea. Like first thing he saw me um, after, after I'd earned the scholarship, you know, after my red shirt year, he, he looks at me and goes, you can't play here. Like I'll help you find another, another school, but you're not playing for me. Wow. And I was just kind of like, like, you know, punched in the gut, but I was like, <laughs> dude, you got to give me a chance. Like you've never, you, you don't know what I can do. Like, right. I don't put me in workouts, like put me with the guards, put me with this. Like I can shoot, I can handle it. I can play at this level. And, um, you know, a week later he came up and apologized. And then as, and, and that for me was like a sign that like this dude is about winning. Like he's right. not about having some ego and doing all this and doing all that. And as, as time went on, so sophomore year, he was bringing in his guys. Junior year, it was kind of like, okay, Mike's really coming into his own. And then mm -hmm. senior year, the offense was really structured around me and what I do well. Ooh. So that also helps in production and the numbers right. go up. So all three of those factors were really, really all crucial in, in becoming a, a, an All-American, really. At what point in your college career did you start thinking, hmm, Maybe I'll go to Europe. I didn't, Europe didn't come across my mind 
until I was put on the all American list after my senior year. And, uh, then it was like agents were hitting me up and, and I was like, Oh, Oh, this wow. just, this just became real. Like this just, because it was, I was, like I said, I was so hyper-focused on, on winning games and being the best player I could be and just doing that. I wasn't, I wasn't halfway through my senior year. Hmm, what am I going to do next year? I was like, I need to just, this is my one time to play basketball at this high of a level. And I'm actually, I'm, a, I'm the best player on a good team. Let me just see how far I can take this thing. Then, so you get, you start getting hit up by agents. What was that process like where you had to decide for an agent and, and maybe for the first time in your, in your basketball career team or agents are trying to get you, you're being recruited. So how was it for you to, to get attention for the first time in your, in your career and then try to figure out, okay, which agent am I going to go with? What, what are my goals? And, and how did you, how did you go about that process? Uh, well, I was in grad school at the time, you know, working on, working on getting my master's, um, cause I had the extra year with, with my redshirt year. And basically mm -hmm. once these agents started hitting me up and I was like, Oh, this is, this is reality now. Uh, basically I had to drop out of school and I was trying to figure out as much as I could about this business. Cause you can, you know, it's, it's kind of, when did we finish? We finished up in, in March. So this is, you know, April and I got school going on, I got classes, but I'm, I'm on the phone for six, eight hours a day talking with different people, talking with players, talking. With, I wish I had a guy like you who knew what was what. And like, I'm not saying that cause this is your show to gas you up, but like I, I had zero it. direction. <laughs> I had, I had nothing. I, I didn't know. And so the only way I could figure out was like, if I talk to enough people and get a feel for it. And like, I remember I had this one guy hit me up, this one agent, he called me and he's like, he's like, Hey, is this Mike? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, he's like, Hey man, how you doing? I'm like, I'm good. I'm like, how are you? He goes, you know, man, just rolling in my new Mercedes. And I was just like, Mm. <laughs> I think you're kind of, you know, not really, the, not shady. really the right guy. Yeah. yeah. Like not a <laughs> little, little too flashy. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of had to figure it out on my own. Um, and, and just talking on the phone with guys. And, and the one thing that I found about, about, uh, an agent and choosing an agent was you got to find someone you trust yeah. and that works for you. Like there's, yeah. there's a, there's a personality, uh, thing that needs to gel, that needs yeah. to make sense, that needs to fit. Um, and so that's what, that's what ended up happening. I've had the same agent the whole time. Uh, he's a guy that's who I, I trust completely. And like, he's, he's, you know, done good by me and, and, you know, I'm doing good by him. So it's, it's like, it, it was a good decision. And, mm -hmm. but yeah, it was, it was a stressful one. It was one that I spent a, probably way too much time making, but, um, it was worth it in the end. Now, yeah, it's, there's, there's not too much time to when it's your about your career you know and i wish that more players took it upon themselves to inform themselves and and i see it now when when i talk to players that it, it's it's hard to to get the information you need of course you can google stuff but i mean how much you're gonna how much information you're gonna get and if you don't have anybody around um to to help you then it's even more difficult i mean i say it often that, that this this generation has much more tools at their hand to investigate things, but if you don't know where to start, all the all the the internet stuff in the world is not going to help if you don't understand the process. And that's why I do what I do to try to help help players um, realize their their potential and realize that it's not as easy as they think to come over here. It's not it's not a game. It's it's a business, and um, you can't you can't just say okay I'm I'm about to go over to Europe. It doesn't work like that. So I, I really appreciate the fact that you put in the time and effort into your career to figure out what agent was right for you and, and everything that goes behind that because a lot of players don't. I mean, do you have any any advice for, for players that, that are trying to come overseas maybe and trying to figure out which agent they should take? I mean, you already said that something has to click, but um, something that you learned looking back on that, that helped you a great deal? I would say... I would say try to find someone that you, you know, or cause the, the, the overseas basketball world is, is pretty small. Find, you know, and yeah. if you're, and if you're that yeah. talented of a college player, you know, someone 
directly or through one connection who has been overseas, who has played overseas and just get in touch with them. They'll have some, you know, cause then that will lead to the next thing and that will lead to the next thing. And that's kind of down the chain. That's how you do it. And, and resources like yourself that are now available. Uh, We recorded a, a podcast episode with my agent and kind of talking about the whole process and what to think and, Mm-hmm. And I know like there's resources out there. Um, but I think really if you have that personal connection with someone in your circle or, yeah. you know, know someone and you can, you can directly reach out and have a conversation with them and, and help them. Cause everyone who's played over here, at least in my experience is they're good dudes. They yeah. want to do the right thing. They're willing to help you out. They're willing to provide some direction, some, some type of assistance, some way, somehow, if they can. It's, it's, different nowadays because I think um, when I was when I was younger and I was playing players weren't as generally open to give information they would give false false information about how much money they were making things like that and um, I think nowadays especially with the internet players are, are a lot more eager to help each other out and which I think is a, a great thing but the only thing is you have to reach out to them they're not going to find you so even if you just write someone on, on social media and say, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about going overseas or I'm, I'm, I, I saw you on this potential agent's page. What can you tell me about this person? I found that that players nowadays are, are genuinely eager to help. But like I said, you have to go out to them. You have to find them. You have to go to them and, and, and just be up front and say, hey, this is my situation. Can you help me out? And I think now, nowadays it's, it's, it's much better than when I, when I first came out. And I, I think too, the, the ability, like, I, I think kind of the stigma around social media right now, especially with the young people is it's dangerous, it's bad, right. and this and that, but like, it can 100% be a, a, an yeah. incredible tool if you use it the right way. And if you're curious, and if you do these things. So I think in a couple of years, you know, how kind of the, the wave of the natural course of things goes, it'll be, hey, I want to do this. I want to find this. This is kind of a niche thing. Overseas basketball is definitely a niche thing. How does that happen? How can I look into that? How can I figure it out? And and I think you'll you'll find a lot kids more kids right. being curious and, and hitting you up in a couple of years. But for right. right now, yeah, the kind of the stigma around the social media, it's it's sort of like, ooh, this, you know, it's it's like a like a hot dish or something. You don't want to yeah. you don't want to touch it too much, you know? Yeah. So your first destination was Australia, right? Correct. Yeah. How, how was ball over there? Uh the level of basketball is pretty bad. Uh, not <laughs> and like uh you know just just incredibly inflated numbers uh but uh the experience of playing over there and being around those people and doing that like is still to this day one of my one of my favorite plays one of my favorite experiences i've had um in 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 my professional career really and after your season in australia the australian leagues usually go until august Right. Yeah. So it was. Yeah. So it was like it was May to August. So I actually left school early. And then uh, another regret that I have uh, from this is like I was so ants in the pants, anxious to get to Europe that I put in my contract. Like if a team signs me in Europe, I can go directly. And right. they weren't this club wasn't paying a lot. Like we made more money from like running camps and helping mm-hmm. kids and doing stuff than from actually playing basketball. Right. Um, so as soon as like as soon as I got interest from a team in Spain, I was like, "Hey, see ya!" And it was like right before the playoffs, and <laughs> I thought it was the right I thought it was the right thing to do. Like like I was like, "Oh, here like we go!" Out. And and what I didn't realize is like getting your visa to go to Spain is like a three week process. It's mm-hmm. it's awful. It's awful. And I had you know I wish I wish I would have stayed and played the two weeks of the playoffs that mm-hmm. we had and uh and seeing that one through before heading home but like i said i was young and answered my pants getting old. and like you know how it is too like the teams will be like we you got to get home we need you we need you here now right. you have to do this right. this way this way and i was like okay okay like I'll, i can do it <laughs> yeah like I'll, I'll figure it out so that was kind of another aspect of it that that didn't didn't help with that decision so after after you played in australia australia you came over to spain for the next four seasons Three different teams and a half. three and a half so yeah 
that's your first European destination. And we all know that Spain has, has pretty good leagues and pretty good home players and national players. Um, what was the difference between Australia, besides the level, and coming over to, to Spain and being a, is it a different kind of basketball? <laughs> yes, like, 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 yeah, well, I mean, uh, so the off the court stuff, the language barrier was obviously right. Matt, um, I was in a small town, no one spoke English. So, right. you know, I, people don't know this. Usually Americans don't realize, but there's more people in the world that speak Spanish than, than English. English. So, it, you know, um, when you're in Spain, like it's the level of English, it's, it exists, but it's not great. So that was, that was a shock to the system. But then basketball wise, I mean, I, like, it was basically, if you look at D2, where I was playing, that was like mm, JV level. And then, <laughs> you know, second division of Spain was really like D1. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, it was, it was such a jump. And, and there were, it, I was, uh, those first two or three months, I was so overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And like I, I, I've touched on before in this, but like I'm so hyper-focused on, on being good in the moment that like I didn't play well for like two and a half, three months. Mm -hmm. And like you can imagine so i'm stressed out in everyday life uh and can't I'm not speak spanish sports. the one thing the one thing that i'm there for to play <laughs> there's one of the guys who simon uh played with him my my second year with the with the same club but like it was dude it was just it was brutal it was such a rude <laughs> awakening like oh like i really don't know anything about basketball like i need to i need to figure this out and luckily i had i had two great coaches who taught me how to play it basketball at the professional level like it, it just my knowledge of the game my IQ just went skyrocketed with those two guys and that was really a, a great situation to be a part of yeah I mean it's 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 difficult when you go to your first professional station okay it was your second but the first one in Europe and it's a totally different thing and, and you, you talked about it the, the the language barrier so if things are not working off the court it stresses you on the court which then in turn stretches you off the court because you're thinking about everything and it, it can really take a long time until players adjust and and I think that's so underrated that people don't understand that it's not just about the, the X's and O's over here because you're in a totally different world. The basketball is different. The the lifestyle is different. Your apartment is going to be different. Every, like you said, little town, nobody spoke English. There's a lot that goes on mentally that that contributes to players not playing well. And if you're not prepared for it in, in you can't be prepared for everything, but if you if you don't understand certain things about what you're going into, it will affect your on the court play, and that's what I try to stress with the people that I consult because it's not just the X's and O's. Yeah, I'm going to tell you. Yeah, watch out for the American travel when you first come over here. That first step is is different over here, although it's gotten better over the years. Like, yeah, I can tell you about that, but nobody's going to tell you about if you don't if you don't take your garbage out the right way. The lady downstairs is going to call your manager and say, hey, he's not separating his trash. The manager then comes to, to the to the practice and says, hey, you need to tr do your trash. You're mad at the, the lady downstairs. And, and it, 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 it sounds really weird, but how, how those little things can contribute to you either playing well or not well. And I mean, I mean, that's a, it, it's a performance based industry, right? right. So like. You, you have to, you have to produce, you have to, there is a, there is a pressure uh, behind that. And like what I wish I knew, and like, you can speak to this as well, but there is, there is, there is a stereotype of like, Oh, you're going to go overseas and crush oh. it. Oh, like, yeah. You're going to, you're oh, going to yeah. drop 20. You're yeah. going to do this. You're going to do that. Yada, yada, yada. And you're like, yeah, like I was, <laughs> I was all American. Like, Spain, what do they know about basketball? Like, you know, Gasol brothers, but like, okay. And, and you just kind of, you show up and then you're like, but what you don't realize is you're one of two guys, one of two Americans. And like the year before, the guys that were there, they had two different Americans who, guess what? They got just as much accolades as you. And then the year before that, same thing. Guess what? The yeah. year after you're there, they're going to bring in two guys who, like, same thing, same type of deal. So, yeah. In, in their mind, like you're, you're just the the guy right now, but you right. really ain't. Until you show them something, until you prove it to them on the floor, they don't really think you're anything. And that's that's, that's a good point. Barrier 
to, to overcome because you're, you're going over the hands. Like, I'm going to drop 20, 25, <laughs> you know, kill it, like no big deal. And it's just not, it doesn't work that way. It's, it's really surprising that, that there's still that myth that Americans, that we as Americans think we rule the basketball world and that we're going to come over here. We're going to wreck shop. We're going to just tear it up. And you got some Spanish dudes looking at you like, saying in Spanish, this dude ain't shit. He ain't shit. We're going to have another American when he leaves. This dude is not that good. And it's like you said, you have to kind of prove that you belong because they've seen Americans come and go. Whether you're in Germany, the Germans, they sit back, they watch. This dude ain't that good. They go to the manager, that dude ain't that good. Manager says, nope, that dude ain't that good. They're going to bring somebody else back to replace you in, in a second, right? So I think it's, um, I, I try to tell people that it's, it's, it's really not as easy as they think when they, when they first come over here. But until you actually live it and experience it, I, you can tell people tell you they're blue in the face. Here, here's, here's a funny story. This is the reality. So the, the, the Spanish guys are, are notorious for this. So they'll, they'll be checking it up before, you know, a half court settle up. They'll look at the other guy and in Spanish, they'll say, back door. Like just that easy. <laughs> and then he'll just do it to the American guy because the American guy has no idea what he's saying. It happened to me. It happened to me. So like, I was like, what does that mean? He goes, back door. I was like, oh, oh like you can't. Could you imagine doing that to somebody in like a pickup game? Hey, go back door. And then like the dude just, you get it off. Like you score off of that. Like that'd be crazy. It, it, that's how it, they treat you. Yeah. Yeah. That's it, how they until treat you. you prove it. Until you prove yourself, you're just like, you are just one of the guys that will be here for a year and probably gone after the year. And, and I mean, it speaks for you that you stayed four years in, in Spain, right? Different teams, but you stayed four years in Spain because obviously teams, could appreciate your your level of play even though you said you got off to a, a difficult start so after you leave spain you go to italy for two years what's the now you're playing in two european countries that are actually very high level countries what was the difference for you and how long did it take you to adjust from being in spain for so long to transitioning to italy spain's a team game spain is completely orientated around the team uh the ball gets moved uh you, know, you might go you might you might go a game you might take three shots you might the next game you might have 13 shots mm -hmm. like it completely depends on on what's happening and just the flow of the game when you go over to a2 uh the pressure of being an american in that league is like you're the guy the ball's going to be in your hands they really i you know to be honest with you i don't really fit uh the stereotypical a2 italy player cuz they want they want like the 6667 six, six, athlete do it all, right. um, can take over a game, can dominate a game. And that just, that just wasn't, wasn't really, it's, it's still not, it's not my play style. Cause like I, like I said, I spent four years in Spain, basically learning how to play the game one way. And then right. making that transition to, to Italy was, was a little different. And like when I got there, it was, I think my teammates were surprised with how willing I was to pass the ball. And I think they were like, <laughs> oh, like Mike, you, you shoot it, you shoot it. And it's like, like I remember one play uh, for one of the games. We had a guy, we had an incredible shooter on our team. And, uh, I mean, he had hit like three or four in, in the first half. And, like, we got a steal. Guy drove it in. There were two guys in the paint, kicked it out. I was wide open at the top of the key, wide open. But the other guy who had hit three or four was trailing me. And he, he said, hey, hey, hey. So I give him the ball, and uh, he missed it. But, like, he was so, like, happy that, like, I was willing to make that the, the easy play and give it to the hot hand. And, I mean, he ended that game eight for nine from three. So, like, you know, I don't feel – the one that he missed was, was probably the most open look that he had all night. But um, for me, that was, that was kind of a unique Italian experience that they, they really wanted you to dominate the game and take over. You're the American and just kind of go in there and just – and I was just like, I play team basketball. That's what I do. And, and that's, I'm going down with that ship one way or the other. Like right. there, don't get me wrong. Like I had games where I got busy, but it wasn't like, wasn't like in the, in the style that, that some of those guys who make a lot of money in that league do right. are very, very, very good players. Right. So now you move on to Holland and you yep. play, you're in Den Bosch. Uh, I go, I go back to Spain for a year. I go oh, back, you went to, back Spain to Spain for a year. 
and then you yep. came to, to Denmark. What yep. was what was the deciding factor for you to leave Spain? Because you had been there then a total of four or five years then. Um, what was the deciding factor for you to leave kind of a comfort zone where you had played to try to join another another country, another league? It was the appeal of playing in an international competition. So this team here plays in the in the FIBA Europe Cup, and uh, I I something one of the goals of mine like so I, I had a couple goals when I you know set out to be a to be a European European player. One was to play in a, a top division, and I made it to the ACB last year, uh, which or yeah the year before. So mm-hmm. and the ACB in Spain is like that's you're playing cream of the crop. NBA basketball like it's it's you know and I, I made it to that level and I performed well at that level uh you know hit a game winner had a 20 piece like had a had a couple of really 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 good games some bad games too like don't get me wrong like I you know <laughs> I put my pants a couple times but like to, <laughs> to make it to that to make it to that level and uh and and to to perform like that in in several of the games so you know the team that I joined they had won two games uh, halfway through the season, I joined them and, and we won five the rest of the way. So I, and I had the, I led that league in uh, plus minus differential. My team was almost 20 points better with me on the floor. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and that's, and the second guy was Walter Tavares. So I was number one, yeah. Tavares was number two. So, you know, go figure. Yeah. Um, and, and like, I think part of that is just kind of the stats, how they worked out, but you know, cause I, Tavares is clearly a better player than I, <laughs> you know, but no one, like I, I, I still love got the modesty, man. Name. I love the modesty. <laughs> yeah. I still, I still got that to my name though. That's one thing I'm, I'm very, very proud of. That's one goal that I checked off that list. And then, so in the summer I was hoping to stay in Spain, maybe get another crack at the ACB. Uh, but you know how it is. Nothing came away. Same thing that's happened my whole career. They look at me and I'm, I'm easy to write off. I don't, I don't pop off the eye test, but, uh, cause you, you can't see the things I, I bring to the team, you know, from a toughness standpoint, from a, you're not there every day in practice, you know, they the don't know how I they, yeah, they don't, they don't know how I am and, and kind of how I, I bring that to the, to the locker room. Uh, but here to come here for heroes, Den Bosch play for this organization, uh, playing in the Phoebe Europe Cup, it just it was it was another box that I could check off. And this is like overall as a year. I'm not saying this just to, because we're champions, uh, but uh, the way this club is run, the coach that I'm playing for, the guys on this team, um, it has just it's been a great decision from a from a basketball standpoint to come up here to this club. So you you injured yourself um, what 20 games in? Yeah, no, right toward the end of the season. So it was season. like April April. Eighth, I think I got hurt and then ended up having surgery like April 10th. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so it was fluke injury. It's called compartment syndrome, um, acute compartment syndrome. If you want to know the details, it's, uh, I had a, I had a surgery called a fasciotomy. Don't Google that uh, if you're if you're if you're queasy. About this stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so basically, I'll, I'll I'll just break it down real quick. It's uh, you get hit in the leg, like just got a normal dead leg, uh, but for whatever reason, my body was just like, hey, that's that's too much to handle. Um, so it closed off that compartment in my leg, which causes the pressure to just rise and rise and rise and rise. And if you don't get a fasciotomy, uh, you could have permanent muscle damage wow. and you could, you could even lose your leg. So, um, yeah, it was, it was extreme. And, and like this thing, like you have to understand it usually happens when people break their femurs in car accidents. Wow. And in, in those cases, it happens to point three percent of those trauma patients and so for this to happen to me and it's just a total freak accident on on a normal play like nothing crazy i got hit in the third quarter of the game finished out the game and Mm. then a week later is when the compartment syndrome set in so i have no idea how it works i'm not a doctor you can they want to do a case study on it it was such a weird such Mm. a fluke injury um but yeah so it it, you know what are you going to do you're going to sit here and feel sorry for yourself and kind of beat your head and oh poor me oh why me or you right. know um i i, I just i no don't pity party. I did that yeah and i i did that for myself when i was when i was 26 and i got my first got my first uh knee injury um that one was that one was way tougher it was a one it was a worse injury two uh that was going to be my fourth year as a pro and i had signed an acb contract and I was pumped to get that shot. And then a week later I get hurt and I'm back home in the summer. Um, so it, it, to have that taken away from me as an opportunity. And then the second thing was 
uh, you know, the finances, the medical stuff back in the right. States. Because I knew if I came back over to, to Spain, they were gonna cut my, well, they were going to cut my meniscus and I'd be back playing in three weeks. Uh, but I probably wouldn't be playing today. Uh, so I I said, I said, Hey, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to stay here. It was a tough decision, but I want to get this thing fixed. I want to do the rehab, right. I want to do all this. And, uh, you know, at at that point in time, I was 26 years old, living in, living in my uh, parents' basement and basically struggling to pay off financial bills. And that Mm -hmm. was, um, that was, that was just, that was mentally so much harder to handle than, than what I'm dealing with right now. So I mean, having been that, having the pity party, now I'm not going to waste my time. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's. Let's talk really quick about um, about being injured as an American overseas because I think not a lot of people understand what could happen. So of course we all have it in our contracts. If you're out a certain number of weeks, you could be literally sent home, right? So, um, but then Bosch kept you and and. Did you you did you you're doing your rehab and everything like that? How was it th- this experience different to when you were injured when you were in Spain? As far as you know, staying there, being being in the rehab, still being with the team. Um, how how was that for you? I mean, you know, be, being injured here. Um, I I'm thankful that my wife was here as right. well. Uh, she, you know. She's not like what I would call enthusiastic about hospitals, uh, but her to step up to the plate and take care of me the way that she did was, was unbelievable. Just an amazing show of strength on her part to, to kind of hold it down. Um, while I was out, uh, I was thankful for, we, I'm in a country with a good healthcare system and great hospitals and everyone at the hospital speaks English. Cause I was thinking about, it, I was like, could you imagine, uh, you know, being in being in Italy or in Romania, and they're like, you got compartment syndrome, and you just be like, <laughs> what? You, what the hell are you doing? You know, you could, and so you, I mean, you might not have gotten it diagnosed. Let's put. I mean, it could that could happen anywhere. Actually, I mean, Germany's got right. great hospitals, but maybe it wouldn't have gotten diagnosed. Yeah, and I mean, even here with all the all the technology that they had, like it was, it still. We went to the uh, emergency room at like two or three in the morning and like they didn't diagnose it until about 10 a.m and they were running me through all sorts of tests i was on morphine i was like oh crazy but um you know and and i got lucky with the with the actual doctor who did my surgery as well um highly qualified guy super professional guy um but also very strong in the sense like he came into that hospital room and he said you know because my first reaction, one, I'm, I've been up for who knows how long. I'm in so much pain mm-hmm. and uh, like morphine, I'm on drug, like this stuff isn't helping. And this guy's like, yeah, you're going to have surgery. Like we're going to have surgery right now. And like my first reaction was like, who the hell are you? Like, <laughs> what? you know, like, what? <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. Like just an idiot. And uh, he was great. He, he, he literally, like, it got to the point, I was lucky my GM was there as well. So he was like, we're kind of going through this whole experience together of right. like, what the hell was going on. Because they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. And, uh, and then for him to be like, if you're staying in my hospital, this is a surgeon, if you're staying in my hospital, you're having surgery. I'm not letting you stay here and not do this surgery. Mm-hmm. That's right. It was just like, yeah and it was you know and i was just like and and my gm heard that too and we kind of like looked at each other and i was just kind of like you know i was on the verge of tears because i knew the season was over at that point i was like if i I get surgery it's done um and and i had been i've been playing great basketball all season so you know that was that was tough to to give up and and all that but yeah i really got lucky um to be taken care of in, in, in a great way. And then I had to stay in the hospital for 10 days and that was, that couldn't have been not, not a great situation, but couldn't have been better uh, to be here. Um, right. And, and so, I mean, even logistically, like it's even a little thing, the, the hospital is, is five minutes away from our apartment. So even, even from that aspect, it, it was, it was good, but it's just, you, you know, you never know, you, you, you put your Put your faith in these your clubs, career. In these cities, your health, your career, and 
it's it's kind of, it's really is a leap of faith at at some point to say hey we're gonna go over there and and you know if I get hurt I I hope I can get taken care of yeah so I, I definitely want to uh, talk a little, little bit about what's going on off the court as I mentioned already you're you're a podcaster yourself um, your podcast is called the Can Do Podcast what got you interested in 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 doing that well it was it's funny so a guy that my co-host actually um, wanted me to be on a podcast that he was doing for his work or something and we got on there and we just clicked we he he we recorded a great episode uh my story uh got out i mean and it was just like we had some good banter and some good flow and and stuff like that and then um he's good friends with my agent like him and my agent are best friends and then he was like hey let's just do this thing they they got all the resources to kind of do it and to producer we have an incredible producer her name's morgan um she takes care of of kind of putting it out and and publishing it and then uh but yeah it just kind of took off from there and like i think we have a pretty good product and we just got to get some steam behind it yeah and and we got some good episodes great story you were great on there i mean like like your your story of breaking your leg uh (laughs) early in your career like you're you're the second broken leg like we've had we've had on the (laughs) podcast like it's kind of you know, it's just, uh, there's so many unique stories and so many things that just don't escape Europe here that we're just right. trying to get out in a, in a good way. And it's, it's fun to do. I've learned so much about from, from different guys, just doing it. Meeting you was, was great. Meeting a handful of other guys, connections. Right. And, and, and the world is so small. You, yeah. you realize how, how many, how interconnected everything is. So it's, it's always fun. Okay. Now I want to talk a little bit about your, I want to give it justice, what you do that what you're developing I, i'm not i couldn't do it just to, to explain it so i want you to do it my thought though is when, when we um, we've we've talked about it and when you, you've shown it to me firsthand and stuff like that and my first thought was damn i wish i was still playing and i could take advantage of what mike is doing so explain what what this is that you're what you're developing and um and how you can help players i think it's great stuff to, to keep it as simple as possible, it's just it's just going over tape with guys. Um, uh, that, but it's uh, not that, that simple. Think, no, it's not. <laughs> uh, my 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 goal with it is not. I I think I I you know, don't no disrespect to coaches, assistant coaches who who cut film up, but I think it is. It's so easy to to look at a game and to look at a clip and say, oh, you should have done this. Oh, you should have done that, and and make it super black and white. Mm-hmm. Um, what I have a unique eye for and a unique skill set for and something that has set me apart in my professional career is I'm in the right spot at the right time all the time. I get the most out of the actions I'm involved in. I do that at, at, and I'm a, a very consistent player. And that's something I take pride in. That's something I've worked very, very hard to do. And I mean, um, so I've developed these tactics, these little you know, the tactics for the game, like every professional player has to gain an advantage in certain situations. But what's more than that is I've developed an eye for watching a game and picking up on tendencies uh, who, you know, of different players and what they can do or systems and what they're going to do. And to one, help guys scout who they're, who they're playing next to take advantage of it, what they're going to do. Uh, two, to uh, point out weaknesses in their games, holes that they can cover up, holes that they can plug up. And then the third thing, which which is kind of, you know, wasn't my idea originally, but, like, it's just fun to watch basketball and, like, watch your own games and, like, and like talk yeah. about it. it, it and it just – it I don't have all the answers. I don't want to act like I'm a, I'm a guru when it comes to this stuff. I do know a lot about the game. I, if you ask any of the guys on, on the team, when I've been out here, the, the scouting and the clips and the things that I've talked about with them has definitely helped them. And they would all agree with that. Um, but to put that whole package together and to create an environment where it's like, Hey, let's enjoy watching basketball. Let's get better from this. Let's do this. And like, let's, have it be an immediate impact thing. The next time you step on the basketball right. floor, you'll be able to implement some of these things, but also recognize that, hey, these ideas, these concepts are skills. This is going to take time. This is yeah. going to take serious patience. thought, patience, repetition, 
practice to kind of get these things down. And my ultimate goal is to say, uh, and, and I've had a couple clients um, who we've been doing this for a while. And now when we watch film, they talk more than I do. It's and automatic. They yeah. ask, they ask me a question or like, sometimes they'll have a question. I'll be like, dude, like, I don't know. And then <laughs> over, over the course of games that I watch during the week, like we'll have some back and forth about, you know, whatever situation that we're talking about. Look how this guy does it. Cause I'll be watching for it in, in certain games and I'll send little clips and stuff. And it's just, you can't know everything there is to know about basketball, no. but you can kind of put some pieces together for yourself to make yourself a more consistent and more efficient player. And I think, I think that's the, that's what I want to help guys with because that at the end of the day, everyone's going to be talented. Everyone's going to, you know, have a certain level of skill. Right. Everyone's going to be able to do X, Y, and Z with the basketball. But like, how are you impacting the game? Where's your defensive positioning at? How's your transition defense? How are you defending these screens? How are you, how are you really going to take their best player out of the game? Mm -hmm. You know? Um, so it, it's just, it's something that, uh, I started doing with my coaches over here and then I, I was kind of like, okay, like I know what they're seeing now I can figure this out. And then I started doing it on my own. And then I was like, Oh my gosh, like this is working. Like this is, yes. I am seeing yes. it. And, and then I was like, okay, let me see if I can help some other guys with it. And I, it's been incredibly successful. I think there were a couple guys in here who I've actually worked with. I don't know if they're still in here, Evan and, and Matt, um, who I, who I've worked with pretty closely this year. And, uh, I, I, they, they, I mean, they're great guys, and to watch the successes that they've had um, has been has been really cool. It's been a part of the journey as well. You mentioned it before, like when when coaches break things down. When I was a coach, my viewpoint was team based. It wasn't so much individual based, where I can say, "Hey, look look at the angle of how you set this screen." Unless I was kind of getting on somebody, like, "Hey, look at the angle you set this screen." You know, it wasn't like the the, the finer things. It was more more team based because I, I, as a coach, am thinking the big whole, right? And that's where I think what you're doing, the service that you're, you're providing, is for the players' benefit. And I'm all pro player. You know me. And um, that the players have an, a resource where they can break things down and break films down and see these little fine details that you wouldn't get in a normal film session with your coach. And that, that, like you said, also, what I thought was pretty dope when we were going through it, that you can actually break down the opposing team so the next time you play them, that your client plays them, they know the tendencies of that player that they're playing against and and i mean you used it you used uh, one of my former players as an example evan harris when when we were watching the, the game you were how you were showing me and it's just incredible how you can see that and of course the more you do it the easier it is for you but also the more you do it with a client like you said then they start picking up on these things and i think that's the ultimate goal that people the players see that for themselves and say oh hey that's where I'm, I need to work on it. That's that's something that I need to I, I need to do, and I think that's a incredible service. What what you're doing. I, it, what's unique about it too, because um, I, I took your advice with this, and I've been working with more pro guys um, doing this, and and so I've I've worked with a couple shooters, like like just great catch and shoot, coming off staggers, that kind of thing, and you know how those guys get defended. They get real, real yeah. handsy, you yeah. know, their, their defender try to either top lock them or just be physical yeah. with them and, and do all that kind of stuff. And, and it's just like, you know, the way, the way I, I, I one of our guys, Austin uh, on my team this year, we were talking about, I was like, look, man, like you're, you get a little antsy, you kind of sneak up two steps and you kill the space before the screen. And then you're kind of in this put, wrestling match, before you really gain an advantage. And I was like that you're making it hard for yourself. For yourself right. And I was, and I was like, but like, sometimes that's what you got to do based on the angle of the screen and some of that. But I was like, other times just wait a second and then go, go quick, go just, you can either be strong or be quick. Right. And you, you can't do one or the other all the time. You mm -hmm. got to switch it up. Mm -hmm. And then, so I, I, we talked about that. We went through some clips and like, uh, just had a nice discussion and then to watch him in these playoff series toy with that idea and really make it his own and kind of develop his own style of of coming off these screens in different ways and using his speed and using fakes and 
um, it was really cool because mm-hmm. I didn't, I didn't know how far he was going to take it, but the, the things that he did and another one of my guys too, like we were talking about it. He's like, yeah. And, and it, he had been kind of struggling throughout the regular season. Now he's in the playoffs and like just the aggressiveness and the assertiveness that he was coming off his screens and flowing into stuff, hitting curls, like a little bit better, one dribble, a little pocket pass, that kind of thing, just the decisiveness and that just from, just from talking through that idea and kind of like, okay, instead of being frustrated, Oh, he's holding me. He's doing this. Like, I don't know how I'm going to get open. I don't know how to do this. We're like, okay, it's a problem. Let's figure out how to solve it. And I don't, I don't want to say like I'm some genius and I had some great, amazing idea, but the actual act of watching the tape, tape talking, the about it, talking about it and having some ideas about it in a, in a non-pressure, mm-hmm. non-coach player relationship exactly. where it's exactly. like, you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to listen to me kind of thing. I- it, 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 the impact of it is, is immediate and I think it's, it's cool to see those guys take those ideas and own them. Um, you and your wife, or actually your wife more so than you, uh, is her name Danae? Danae. Danae. Like Danae the, Danae the passing link. <laughs> so you guys did a story steal for my Instagram page, which which came off really good. I got some really good feedback from it as well. Um, you talked a little bit about, about it before, but I, I want to get your impressions again on what it's like for you to have your wife with you. She's Spanish, right? Yep. Yep. To have her with you and experience the ups and downs you you said talked about one one of the downs being in the hospital but having someone with you being away from home and and being able to understand and kind of give you a a way out is she is she sitting right there yeah she's looking at me with a kick it <laughs> so, you know, how, um, how important is it for you to have have her around oh man um you know it's it's one of those things, man, you can't, until you've been in a relationship like that, until, you know, I got, I got lucky, uh, with her and, um, it can get lonely over here. You know, a lot of, you know, I'm sure in in your first couple of years and, and to find someone in my case from a completely different culture, completely different background. Um, and, and, to share this journey with them and then to uh, you know, it's been hard for her in moments as well, staying over here. Um, she had, she's had to make a lot of sacrifices as well, uh, yeah. leaving her family, leaving sure. her friends, uh, coming to a place where they don't speak Spanish. It's, it's English and, and watch her grow with that. And she had a, she had a good level of English before. It's not like she didn't understand, but to watch her, her grow with that and to grow together in that, um, you know, it's just, I'm convinced you grow from experience and to grow together mm-hmm. with this experience that we've had away from, from everybody where it's just us, where it's, you're relying on each other so much. And, and like I said, uh, when I was down and out the, the way she stepped up to the occasion, I mean, she was with me in the hospital. She, she took me to three in the morning. Hey, we got to go. Okay. No problem. What do you need? Um, I, 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 I'm without, I'm getting a little emotional, but I don't mean to get too, too corny. No problem, man. You don't, you don't find that type of connection, uh, every day and, and to share this, I mean, the success that we had with the championship, um, to share, uh, the failures with my injury uh there was a moment yesterday during the celebration where I was getting a little overwhelmed and I was just like you know because it, it's hard man like it's it, it, I get a little anxiety a little bit of this a little bit of that just hey let's go for let's go for a walk let's bring my bag to the car mm-hmm. and just find her and I was just like, okay everything's okay we'll do that and and coming back to your apartment and having it be a home right uh makes a hell of a difference yeah yeah it does so like i said before your wife is is spanish can you imagine you living full-time in europe yeah oh yeah man (laughs) she's from from san sebastian spain man that is one of it is the coolest city i've ever lived in ever been in um phenomenal i like uh yeah it's yeah being being full-time uh 
full-time European taking a taking a page out of your notebook as they say <laughs> uh is definitely on the agenda okay so um we're running out of time actually we're over time I, I didn't realize how fast it went I've got um a couple let me see which ones I want to ask you all right this is a good rapid, one quick rapid fire rapid fire okay this is maybe not a rapid fire one, but it's it's an important question. Did you have a welcome to Europe moment? Okay, you had already been to, to Australia, but did you have a welcome to Europe moment when you first got over to Spain where it opened your eyes like, hey, Dorothy, we are not in Kansas anymore? Two things stand out. One, uh, my like second week there, second week of preseason, they had what's called San Mateo in Logroño, Spain, which is their big city festival. Mm -hmm. Blew my mind was unbelievable. <laughs> um, you know, just uh, the, the, the tapas, the wine, the experience, the people. It was just like <laughs> sensory overload. That was, that was really cool. And then, uh, and then the second one was um, my worst game I've ever played as a pro, which was um, I had a minus nine player efficiency, which is brutal. That's pretty bad. Absolutely, it's pretty bad. Um, <laughs> for an American, I, I had, I had, I had the oh shit, I, I'm about I to get fired. <laughs> am I going home? And the only thing that kept me, that kept me on the team, that kept me in the job was the guy they sent home was from Portugal and he kind of wanted to get out of there. But the other thing was, I was in the gym, I was an hour early and I stayed an hour late, and it didn't matter that we had two practices a day. My assistant coach, poor guy, he was there rebounding <laughs> for me early. Like it, it was like I am going to figure this out. I am going right. to be good at this. Like like failure is not an option. And and they saw that in my mentality, and they knew I would I would put it together. They I they, I just needed time to figure out the European game. So that one that minus nine valoration over in Huesca. That I'll never forget that game. <laughs> okay, and the last one. Um, I, I find this question rather interesting. Is there anyone that inspired you um, or helped you get to where you are now that probably doesn't know it? Ooh, that probably doesn't know it. Like not uh, your parents or, you know, just somebody yeah. who, who might, might have given you some kind of inspiration that, that, and they just don't even know it. Because I know there's been people that, that I, I've kind of drafted as mentors as I, as I got older. And, um, but sometimes you don't, you don't get a chance to tell them, hey, you really helped me. It might have been a gesture. It might have been a talk. But someone who who really helped you, and you know that they helped you, but they might not know it. I got I got a I got a group of guys um, for you. So this this will be kind of a unique answer. But it's it's the same guys or the guys who played my position on every team I've ever been on. And uh, Jermel Kennedy, Zimmy Wobo, um, Pat Baldessari. Uh, who else? Andre Valentini, um, Dino Radoncic, Will McGarity. Like I, the, those guys that you have to guard and you have to play against every day in practice. You, you learn them in a different way. You, right. you they motivate you answer. in a different way um, to to really get better. And I mean, like I, the the way I am, I go I go at those guys every every day. I would poor Jermel, man. Like he. <laughs> I remember he was just like, Mike, just chill out. Slow down. Just one day, just like, <laughs> can we just not, you know? And it was like, it was like, oh, I got him today, you know, type of thing. Um, but it, those guys have all made me better. They've all, you know, um, they, I won't act like we hadn't gotten into, you know, little scuffles, little arguments. Little, it wasn't always Happens. a great relationship. Um, but, you know, I, those are those are guys that motivate me and, and uh, I hope I motivate them in, in some way or another. So that's my answer for you. That's a, that's a really dope, dope answer. I, I, I wasn't expecting that. That was a really uh, – I'm about to cry over here, man. <laughs> You're thinking about those guys you beat up, you beat up in practice, huh? No. No, you know what? For me, it, it's, it's a guy that, um, that I played with my first four years in Austria that he, he wasn't my position, but he was like kind of the, the old head on the team and he had a lot, of, a lot of experience and he was like the man for many years before I came. And he was, he pushed me. He wasn't always nice. He was always straight. But he definitely pushed me in a way that, that definitely made me better. Sometimes I didn't understand it. Sometimes I didn't want to hear it. Sometimes 
I thought he was wrong, and I still think he was wrong about a, quite a lot of things. But still, in a way, I might not have had the career or the, definitely the length of a career that I had without him. And he pushed me. And, and I don't even think he knows this, but um, but there's some things that I, I couldn't stand. I couldn't stand him. And, and we actually don't talk today. But um, but still, I appreciate the fact that he pushed me. And that's I mean, you don't have to, it's not always going to be. And he was an American. You know, it wasn't a he wasn't an Austrian guy. He was an American guy who you think you have the most camaraderie with. But it wasn't like that. And and I think it had its reasons. But um, but still, without people like that, that, that push you you probably don't get as far as or for me as far as I did. So that's that that's why that was that's what I was thinking when you started when you started talking about that. Um so that's why I really appreciate um that that was a, a dope a dope answer. So yeah, yeah, no man, it's it's true. It's a it's like the thing you don't realize is like when you when you go to a team or when you go to a place like the guys that you're going to be playing against the most are the guys on that on your, on team. your team. Yeah. And and so you better <laughs> You better if you want to stand out in front of coach you better know what they're going to do and take it away from them <laughs> yeah all right man so um it's 10 10 out here i want you to get to your wife i know she's sitting there she's probably got the frying frying pan above your head like hey get off the off the phone um so get on about your your night i really appreciate you coming on man um you know we'll be in touch and and you know you and i have some things in the works and um i i, I look forward to following your journey and seeing how you come back from your injury. I'm sure you're working hard for that. And and doesn't matter if you're in Den Bosch or, or wherever you decide to go for next season or the next seasons. I hope you keep continuously building on what, what you've had in the past. And, and I think you'll, you'll be able to do that. So I, I look forward to that, to watching you grow as a, as a player and as a man. And um, yeah, so we'll be in touch and get on out of here to your wife, say hello from me. Thank you for letting me tag her and um, yeah, get on with your night, celebrate and get back to therapy and tell your guys, get the chip. Will do. Will do, Sean. Thanks for having me on, man. You're a great resource. I hope, I hope this thing that we're both doing kind of grows together and, and we can reach the people with it. Yeah, me too, man. So get out of here. Let me say goodbye to the teammates that are still watching. So right. how, everyone. How do, hey, I, how do I leave? Do I just, just close click it? the X. Okay, there we go. I'm, I'm, <laughs> All right, child. All right, man. Later. So, teammates, thank you.